Thank you for listening to the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast with hosts Clara and Jimmy Hinton. If you're new to the podcast, please subscribe and share so you will never miss an episode. Android users can find us and subscribe on your Play Music app. Apple users can find us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. You can find us on Stitcher. You can follow us on Spreaker. And you can find the podcasts on jimmyhinton.org or findingahealingplace.com. Please rate our show, subscribe, and share so that we can spread the word. Let's get into the show. Okay, welcome to this week's episode. This is Jimmy Hinton, and today I'm flying solo. My mom is uh, out of town. She went away, and we kind of discussed this. Um, What do we do? Do we skip a week? Um, Do we still record? How do we record? And we both decided that um, we're going to continue to record. So if you can believe it, my mom actually gave me permission to record without her. No, I'm just kidding. She's an all right gal. I like that Clara Hinton. So I was kind of wrestling with, uh, with what to talk about. And, you know, I, um, she didn't really give any input and she just said, yep, just discuss whatever's on your heart. So, um, there's been something that's been weighing on my heart pretty heavily. And, and I just, uh, I wanted to discuss this and, and hopefully this is an encouraging and, uh, an upbeat podcast. And so I'm speaking especially to the survivors who are listening. Um, man, I, I just preached a sermon this, this past Sunday and it, it was the passage in, uh, Matthew chapter nine, where Jesus says that the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. So, you know, he's, he's, he's asking his disciples to pray for more labors. He's saying, you know, there's, there's plenty of harvest. Um, you need to pray to God that he's going to send more laborers out. And that's, that's really how I, how I feel about, um, what's going on with, uh, the masses of people who are leaving the church. And I get so many messages from people, um, that, you know, they're, they're, they're survivors of abuse and they've just gone through horrible, horrible, life circumstances and you know abuse is just awful there there's there's just no other way to put it it's it's horrible it's horrifying and the church ought to be the first place where you go to seek community and to seek shelter and to seek love and you should be receiving all of those things we we're not really good at being hospitals for the injured um, churches just generally are not good hospitals for, for the spiritually injured. And that's not to say that all churches are bad. Um, there are certainly good churches out there. Um, I, I'm encouraged to see more and more churches that, that really get it, that really understand trauma and they really understand, um, the need and the capacity to, to, just minister to and, and nurture survivors of abuse. Um, but unfortunately, there are still a lot of churches out there, and, and a lot of you are recipients of this kind of bad behavior, where church leaders come back and, and they, they ridicule you, um, or they tell you that you're just over-exaggerating, or they tell you that... Um, because of the whole Me Too Church Two movement, that you're just blowing things out of proportion. Um, they don't really have the right to say that unless they've been in your shoes, right? And so it, it, it's an entirely unfair for anybody in in the religious community, whether it's a church leader or whether it's a, a lay member. It's really unfair for people to come back and say to the survivors of abuse you're just exaggerating or we just feel like you're too bitter and you're just holding on to this anger and bitterness and you need, you need to let go. And I, I think they may be well-intentioned. I don't know. Some people are, some people aren't, but either way, it doesn't matter whether you're good intentioned or not. Um, those kinds of things are, are damaging and hurtful. 
And so what I'm seeing happen is that there is a massive number of survivors of abuse who, you know, whether that's spiritual abuse or sexual abuse or uh, domestic violence, there's a massive amount of, of survivors out there who are still believers, but they've left, they've left the church. They, and I don't blame them. This is not a judgment. I completely get it. I completely understand. They've either left the church or they've been kicked out of the church. And so you guys are kind of struggling and, you know, you're, you're thinking, okay, where do I belong? Right. Uh, the church community doesn't, doesn't accept me. Um, they don't embrace me. It doesn't feel like they love me, but yet you still, you still believe. And so what do you do? And I think a lot of people are just living in the wilderness right now. You know, it really is like the Israelites when, when they spent 40 years in the wilderness, they were just wandering. They still believed, um, but they were, they were a mess and they just struggled. And, you know, I, I think a lot of people are just in that place right now. And so I, I preached on the sermon, not because of this, but, you know, I was just kind of pleading with my church to really pl- pray that we have laborers who go out into our community and that they work and that they reach people who are truly oppressed. And so, you know, I, I kind of laid that out there, but here was the passage. It was in Matthew chapter 9. And I'm just going to read the first part of that because it's, it's, it's really cool. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Okay. I want to, I want to kind of zero in on that verse for a couple reasons. One, is that Jesus didn't chase down the religious fanatics. Those aren't the people who who he was really ministering to. Jesus ministered to the outcasts. Jesus ministered to people who were oppressed. Jesus ministered to people who were abused. Jesus ministered to people who were poor. Um, Those are the people who he intentionally reached out to. And so... It's interesting because this is, this phrase is used several times throughout the Gospels. When Jesus fed the 5,000, uh, he's on the boat. He, he's actually trying to escape crowds of people to get rest, him and his disciples. The crowd finds out where he's going. They run across the top of the Sea of Galilee, which is actually a lake. It's not actually a sea. Um, it's only six miles wide. It's 11 miles north to south six miles east to west. So they row across the lake, and on the other side of the lake, there's this crowd of 5,000 people that they're waiting for them. And it says that Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So this saying is used repeatedly throughout the Gospels. But in Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chooses some pretty interesting words. So these words for harassed and helpless um, literally mean... The first word for harassed is skulo. So in the original language, the word is skulo, and it means literally to flay or to skin alive or to be mangled. And it's translated troubled, but it was a, it was an expression. It was, it was a Greek expression that people used. And we have all kinds of expressions that we use, but it was a figure of speech. But literally that word means it, it was, it was people who had been flayed. They had been skinned alive. They were they were troubled. It was great distress. And then the next word um, for helpless is ripto. And ripto means they were thrown off or thrown down to the ground or cast away. You remember that passage when Judas walks in after after uh, Jesus had been led. To the cross, Judas is, he's, he's angry and he walks in and he throws the money down. Uh, Matthew chapter 27 and verse five, Jesus threw the pieces of silver. That word is ripto. It's the same word that's used in this passage. 
So it, it's this sense of these people who've been filleted and they've been thrown aside, they've been cast aside, they've been thrown down. And when Jesus looked at the crowd, he recognized the people who had been mistreated and abused by the shepherds, by the leaders, by their community. These were the castaways. They were the people who they'd been severely mistreated. They they just didn't have a home. They didn't fit in into the Jewish community. Um, chances are pretty good that that a lot of these people didn't go to synagogue. Uh, quite frankly, because they weren't welcome, they didn't. They didn't have a home. They didn't belong. They weren't part of the community. They had diseases. They were, you know, they, they suffered with poverty. Um, they just were harassed and helpless. And it's interesting that Jesus' compassion increases when he looks on the crowds that have that have been cast aside, that have been thrown out. Sadly. My experience has been with churches that they become irritated and agitated when people really struggle. And so a lot of churches are, are, are super slow to, to help people who legitimately struggle, who legitimately need help. And it, it just breaks my heart. It makes me sad that people who need the most help are thrown out. And I use the analogy of hospitals a lot. So imagine if you show up to the ER. You know, you pick up the phone, you call 911, you're actively asking for help. You're desperate. So an ambulance comes, it picks you up. So at first, you know, your 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 hopes are up. And you think, my goodness, somebody's coming here. They're, the paramedics the paramedics are showing up. They're going to take me to the hospital and I'm going to be taken care of. But you get to the ER, and the first thing the doctor starts doing is ask ask you all these probing questions. Well, you know, what did you do to bring this on? Um, what were you doing at the time? What were you wearing at the time? Did you ask for this to happen? You know, did you ask to have a heart attack, or did you ask, um, you know, were you eating bad food? And he's just interrogating you. And a lot of you survivors, I, I, I think this will speak to you because you experience this. Where you come and, and you're crying out for help. And the, and the church leaders start asking you all kinds of questions. Probing questions. Judgmental questions. Jesus didn't do that with people. You know, when people came to him and they cried out for help, he didn't get out his checkboard and start asking them all kinds of questions. Well, what did you do to bring this on? Jesus never told people that you dug your own grave and now you have to lay in it. You know, Jesus didn't treat people who were castaways this way. Jesus' compassion increased when he found people who were really struggling. And so, you know, imagine you go to the ER, the doctor is asking you all these probing questions, and then at the end of the day, he says, well, we can't really help you because You just have all this bitterness inside of you. And, you know, we're glad that you came to the hospital. We're glad that you stayed here for a short time. But you just, um, you need to move on. And maybe it's better that you find some other hospital. Imagine if hospitals treated patients that way. And it's crazy because this is what we're doing in a lot of these churches. We're treating people who have these severe spiritual wounds as if they're the ones who have this major problem and they're just inconveniencing um, the church leaders and and even other people in the church because it's not just the leaders again you know it's it's other people in the church that they say pretty hurtful things as well and so when your community turns on you on the oppressed and at the same time they're embracing the oppressor it makes no sense And there's no biblical foundation for that. And so Jesus gets it. He understands it. So it's in this context that he he says, it's the next verse that Matthew records. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Well, what's the harvest that Jesus is talking about? In its context, 
This harvest that Jesus is talking about is all these castaways. It's all the people who've been thrown out by the religious community, and they don't really have a home. They don't belong anywhere. And so Jesus is saying, you know, you need to pray to God that more laborers come into this field. So I've been thinking about this, and this has been weighing pretty heavily on my heart. And I'm thinking, man, there are probably, um, uh, my guess is millions of survivors just in the United States alone who are still believers, but they don't have a religious community who accepts them, who embraces them. They are the castaways who Jesus is talking about in Matthew 9. And so it's, it's my prayer that more laborers go out and minister to those people. And I, I, I was, you know, I, I'm just kind of talking through this. So, you know, this is not like collected, gathered thoughts like our normal podcasts are. This is just me kind of laying out what's on my heart. So I really struggle with that. And, you know, I've been kind of asking, well, what's, what's my place? What's my role in all of this? And I just keep envisioning this safe church, this place where people are free to come and they're free to bring their hurts and they're free to bring their struggles and they're free to bring their, their addictions, whether it's drug addictions or uh, food addictions or whatever it is, you know, they're, they're free to bring their struggles where they won't be judged. And uh, I'm really toying with the idea, and, and I don't know yet. This, so this is not me making plans to do this, but I'm really toying with the idea of just giving like short online sermons or devotionals or something like that that's specifically for the community of, of abuse survivors. People who, you know, you're not going to get preachy stuff. You're not going to be told what you have to do. You're not going to be talked down to. It's just a place where we just explore the passages like this, where Jesus' compassion increases for the people who are genuinely hurt. And another component to that that, that that I was thinking about is I think survivors have so much to offer in ministry. And I feel like a lot of times people feel like they have to have a degree or they have to have all this like incredible Bible knowledge to, to be able to lead ministries. And I'm finding out that a lot of the most effective ministries are led by people who just have a heart for it. And you don't have to wait around for permission to minister to the people who are in front of you. And that's what I love about this. And that, that's what I'm encouraged by. And that's what I'm starting to see more of with the Me Too Church 2 movement. I'm seeing a, a, a pretty dramatic increase in the number of survivors who are ministering to other survivors. And I'm really encouraged by that. And I just want to encourage you guys to keep doing that. And don't let people stop you. Don't let people discourage you. Don't let people tell you that, you know, you're not doing it right. Or, um, you know, that's not the way that we do things. We've never done it like that before. Don't let those people talk down to you and discourage you. When you have a passion to help other people, just step up and do it. And that's exactly what my mom and I do. And, you know, we, we do what we do because we just have a burden for it. Um, we just felt like we needed to do something with all the struggles that we went through and not just wallow in that, but actually turn, turn something productive out from the pain and, and, and the, you know, all the trauma that we experienced as a family. We really wanted to pass that on and, and help other people. And so that's why we do what we do. Um, it's just a, it, it's a passion of the heart and it's just something that we feel called to do. So I just want to encourage everybody who's listening, um, man, just go out there and, and, and minister to people. Just love on people, find people who are struggling and just help them, talk to them, care for them, look at them with compassion, the same compassion that Jesus did when he looked on this crowd and he just starts praying that 
more laborers go out into this harvest field. Because I can tell you right now, you know, just from my inbox, you know, my email inbox is just flooded with messages. Um, there are plenty of people out there who are struggling. So I just want to encourage you and let you know there are people out there who, who are really coming to the forefront and, and those numbers are growing. And I want those numbers to continue to grow. So be part of that group when you're ready. Don't feel pressure. Don't feel obligated. Don't feel guilty if you're at a place right now where you're not able to minister to other people. But that time will come. And when that time comes, be ready and just be encouraged. So we really appreciate our listeners. And, uh, you know, we probably don't express that enough. But we got some really good feedback from people. And I think people are really encouraged by by the podcast that we do. So if you're one of those people, um, if you benefit from these podcasts, please pass that on. Please share them. Let people know. Um, we really want those numbers to grow. Um, not for selfish reasons, but just because we want to help people. Uh, we just love hearing these stories. We love hearing success stories. And we love hearing when, when people are empowered. And that's another really cool thing about these podcasts is, you know, several people have been empowered um, by these podcasts to, to report their abusers. And uh, I'm just really encouraged by that because it, it takes guts. It takes a lot of guts to report your own abuser. But there are several people who've reached out to both mom and me. And they said, you know, we, we had no intentions of reporting our abuser, but we listened to, to some of your podcasts and we just felt empowered and we did it. And I'm like, man, that is awesome. That's really cool. So I, I just, we're grateful for you guys. We love our audience and, um, we're going to keep doing these podcasts as, as long as we're able to. So, uh, be encouraged today and we will catch you next episode. Thanks guys. Thanks again for listening to today's episode of the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast. If you found it helpful, please follow on Spreaker, subscribe on Google Play Music, Apple Podcasts, or Stitcher. Share with your friends and tell the world. Join us in speaking out on sex abuse so we can change the tides and prevent abuse.